Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Understanding the Dynamics of Cloud Computing for Procurement in 2016. I would now like to introduce Konstantin Limbarakis, Director of Product Marketing at Determine. Hello, thank you for that introduction, and wanted to uh, welcome everybody this morning or this afternoon, depending upon where you're joining us from in the world, uh, on this very interesting topic. Uh, I want to first get started here with the, a quick agenda of what we're going to be addressing um, on, on our webinar this morning. And what we're going to be talking about is really just you know, doing some basic introductions of our esteemed panelists, uh, two uh, gentlemen that are you know, very focused in the industry and on the topic of cloud computing. And then what we're really looking to do here is keep this as an open forum discussion for our webinar today. Our goal is to pose questions that are really on the top of the minds of almost probably everybody in business today, and even in more particular for those in the procurement industry as we deal with technology and issues. And as I introduce my, uh, my panelists, what we're trying to look to do is really understand the discussion around the growth in, in the cloud and understanding the investment, why people are, are so focused on this topic as a discussion understand some of the benefits that we're seeing in the cloud, look at some of the concerns around areas like the compliance and data that relate to some of the security discussions that people are always having about considering to move to the cloud or ongoing areas as, as the cloud expands as it, in its influence. And then finally, look at some of the dynamics of understanding the future of the cloud and what that will mean based on what's, being, what's changing with mobility, and, and the increased usage of, of cloud frameworks overall. And then finally, we want to give this uh, forum, so to speak, an opportunity to be open to our, our guests that you have joined as, as part of our webinar and have an opportunity to ask some open questions to our panelists to really get into a true dialogue and discussion, um, much in the spirit of a TED framework, if you will, so that we could really understand what's happening and how all the things that we see within the cloud framework is, is affecting us uh, today in technology and in, in, in business. With that, I'd like to really have a, an opportunity to introduce uh, our first guest here, who is Mahir uh, Nana, Nanavati, uh, who's the SVP of product at TradeShift, who's joining us uh, from the West Coast in California in Silicon Valley. Mihir, uh, welcome to the uh, broadcast, and wanted to sesh, do a shout out, say hello. How are you doing today? I'm doing good, Constantine. Thank you so much for this introduction. I'm really excited to spend the next few minutes to talk about this uh, topic with everyone here. Uh, again, my name is Mihir Nanavati, and I run product at TradeShift, and uh, let's get going. Excellent. Thank you, Mihir. And I guess on the um, other side of the world, uh, joining us is my colleague and a chief product officer at Determine, Julian Nadeau, who is joining us from uh, uh, Provence in, um, in France and wanted to say hello, bonjour. Yeah, hello, hello everyone. So glad to be here with, uh, with me here. Uh, you, Constantine, and everyone on this uh, webinar. So, yeah, and uh, I'm the chief product officer of Determine. I was previously the, the founder of BPAC, a tech company in the in the procurement. Uh, I'm considered as a technologist as well, so that's why the cloud is uh, is something very familiar for me. And happy to discuss about this topic and give any any insight on that. Excellent. Thank you, Julian. And I, of course, I'm joining you here from the cold realms of Chicago uh, in the Midwest and uh, look forward to being your host today uh, on this webinar as we present this as we present this topic. So in order for us to get to know a little bit more about our perspectives as the presenters on the webinar, uh, we want to make sure that uh, we do a little intro in, in a kind of a commercial, if you will, a little bit about what we do as a company, respectively. And again, we're joining the, the, the uh, webinar together as partners, and so talking a little bit about what we do individually and how we work together will certainly give you guys on the call and understanding. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Mihir, to talk just a little bit about TradeShift and what you what your organization does uh, in, in the technology space. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, I think the, the, it will keep it very quick and brief. 
TradeShift is a company that's building a network, uh, a network where companies and people who work in the companies can connect with each other. Uh, and the reason why they may want to connect with each other is to run various business processes once they are connected uh, to each other. These business processes typically may be related in the area of buying and selling goods and services. And in the industry, many people call it source to pay. Uh, but that's a, bro a, a an industry specific representation. We of course have a big ambition and a vision to uh, facilitate many digital processes in the cloud based on the connectivity that we established on the network. Our company was founded in 2009 in Denmark and subsequently has expanded into many global locations. We are now headquartered in San Francisco and uh, have many uh, locations uh, all over the world. We have uh, uh, more than 40 enterprise customers and 150,000 companies connected on the network uh, in more than 200 uh, countries. So that's what we do. We talk a little bit about uh, the products that we um, offer. Our main focus um, once we connect companies uh, on the network is to facilitate uh, transactions that are in the source to pay domain. Um, and we have uh, three products uh, that are specifically targeted towards that. Uh, one is around uh, e-procurement, uh, which is uh, a very recent uh, product launch from TradeShift. Um, we call this product TradeShift Buy in a very simple way, which really talks about a, taking a innovative, fresh, and a simple approach to e-procurement. Uh, and that allows people to buy uh, products and place orders with suppliers. Uh, TradeShift Risk is another product which allows uh, people to connect their suppliers and their entire supply chain and manage the risk associated uh, with the uh, uh, regulations and so on that may be necessary in terms of supply connectivity. And finally, TradeShift Pay is our electronic invoicing and AP automation product which essentially uh, pays the supplier and takes care of all the processes related to that. Um, and finally, the notion that we are a platform allows us to extend our uh, business processes through uh, other apps on the network. And a great example of that is our partner Determine uh, that is working with us to build other apps that may not be trade score competence but are necessary in the source to pay domain. So we look at our partner ecosystem as part of our platform and app strategy. So that's what we do and I'll hand it back to you, Constantine. Okay, thank you, Mihir. And you know, that sets up a really good stage for just a quick introduction to determine and the idea of you know how we're working together in the cloud with with uh, with TradeShift and the standpoint of the idea of a platform as a service. And we're going to talk a little bit about that over the webinar today. Just quickly, as we get through the, organ the organizational chart here, understanding again, determine uh, a company that we have, a new name as of last year, having 300, over 300 clients around the world with the real focus in the area of source to pay um, on our platform. Um, we are a recognized provider in the space. Um, and we really look to help expand the, the influence of what we're doing in the source to pay area uh, by working with our thousands of enterprise users uh, with interconnected and modular integration with our platform, whether it's technology that's inherent to the determined platform or working with partners like TradeShip. Overall, we're a company that is, is global, as, as we had mentioned before, traded on the NASDAQ around 200 people worldwide working in, in offices in six countries with our headquarters um, in San Mateo, uh, California. And then in terms of what that means, um, that also shows that we are a technology platform provider that has solutions um, that do uh, work together on the source to pay uh, framework. So working in areas such as contract management, analytics, strategic sourcing, uh, procure to pay, um, all areas that we focus on and in areas then that we want to expand uh, and expand into the, the cloud, we work with partners like TradeShift. And, and I'm going to turn this over to Julian to give his unique perspective uh, as our chief product officer on, on, on how we look at the world uh, with our solution. 
Yeah, and, the, and this slide is pretty interesting because what we can see is, of course, we do source to pay, so contract management, sourcing, uh, pro procurement, invoicing, and we used to be a, really a software company uh, building a software for, for big enterprise, and we moved into the cloud in 2009, and by doing that, we had to architect the, the product in such a way that we're able to move uh, to kind of different layers uh, with integration, business solution, apps, uh, and what we call now the business network. And the business network is really what we call, the, it's like a SaaS solution, but it's all uh, tight on one platform, and this business network is completely collaborative. So that means that we can connect the business network to any other provider, any network, and what's interesting here is we move from software to network and TradeShift is moving from network to software or BPM or business process management and that's where we met actually. So we just think that being able to connect different applications together uh, brings more power and uh, leverage what, what is the cloud. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Julian, for that introduction and, and discussion. So. What I'd like to do now is go ahead and move over into the, the first core of our areas, the idea around the growth of the cloud. And, you know, when we look at some of the logos here on this next slide, it's clear that, you know, we're all in some great shape or form. Most, if not all of us, are already in the cloud if you're using your smartphone or your tablet or your web browser. And you're using the cloud by tapping online services like Apple's iCloud and uh, or you're dealing with streaming video through, through Amazon, or you're using your Facebook to, 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 to uh, post a, a recent event, or, or just using Google Gmail, or even Google Slides like I'm doing right now through our webinar. And it's interesting is, is that in 1999, I think, Julian, you shared this with me earlier, Andy Grove, the CEO of Intel, had a good laugh when he said that in five years, back in 99, that there would be no internet companies but that all companies will use the internet or will be dead. And he meant that by 20 or by 2004, all companies will have to use the internet in some way or the other. And what we're truly seeing today is that the, the cloud has completely revolutionized the technology as, as we know it. Some of the largest companies that are traded in, in stock markets today, Google, Apple with the $517 billion valuation, Google 481, Microsoft 409, Facebook 267, Amazon 273, and, and IBM at 117. But then if you look at a company like Salesforce, who is maybe much smaller, 445 billion, one thing we see is that they are truly a one of those organizations that came from that cloud basis and has completely revolutionized uh, the way we look at software today. And knowing that all these other companies that we mentioned are having such a large impact with cloud and to further show that impact, Amazon Web Services, the Amazon Cloud industry today, um, that, that is worth more than all of its e-commerce business and grows three times faster, showing that after having had a few companies using the Internet back in 1999 when Andy Grove brought this up, all companies now are really developing in the cloud. So, so what does that mean? Well, when we look at the growth, we can see that some of the statistics, uh, this data presented by Dow Jones, shows that over the past five years, six years now, that the deal sizes have gone four times uh, the size of financing over the past five years. Deal sizes have gone and grows 1.8 times over the same period, showing the amount of money and interest that's being generated into what we're looking at in terms of cloud uh, developments. Another um, statistic here that's really interesting is to see the Bessemer value um, um, index here, or Bessemer Venture Partners Cloud Index, and what this is is a, a showing of a comprehensive list of dynamic uh, of the dynamic market that shows all leading cloud companies over the past decade. Um, companies that are in this index include companies like Verisign or Kyoda or Trejo or DocuSign, LinkedIn. You know, very familiar names, and we can see here clearly is that the, the growth in the index and the value compared to you know, the core indices that we know, like S&P and NASDAQ and Dow Jones, uh, is just clearly you know, double there. The other thing we can see here um, that we look at from a framework is understanding that the revenues in these organizations is, is growing by leaps and bounds. So back in 2008, we can see that the market was 
$1.5 billion of the cloud market. In 2014, it's $56 billion, and it's projected to grow to 127 by 2008. And this includes a variety of different types of cloud frameworks, so whether we're dealing with private cloud or legacy software that have moved to cloud or even pure play cloud players. There's a number of different ways of looking at that, and we're going to talk about that on our call today. And then finally, we can see here, as, as part of the growth of the cloud, just the framework of understanding that cloud has got a lot of nuances, so that we have cloud in terms of platform as a service, we have cloud as an infrastructure as a service, we have cloud just as a software as a service, as most of us know it. And by looking at this graph, we can clearly understand that there has been this tremendous growth in the install installs and the growth at 24% over those course of the years. And what is interesting is to also see that the growth there in areas like platform as a service is going to be continuing and seems to have the most increase. And it would be interesting to get your perspective in here uh, on, on, on that. So with that being said, there's a lot of information that we just threw at you. And we can see here that it's, it's clear that you can't neglect uh, the growth of the cloud. And so what I'd like to do at this point is turn this over to our, our panelists and say, what's really, in your opinion, driving the growth and investment in the cloud based on some of these frameworks that, I, that I've shared with, with you, you both? Uh, and, and tell me your story. What do, you, what do you guys think, and how do we look at this uh, from, from the overall perspective? So, Mihir, why don't you start? Give, give me your perspective on this. Yeah, sure. I think uh, one of the things that we've seen in terms of how business software gets uh, evolved in today's uh, uh, day and age is that we are uh, taking for granted a lot of the, what we see on a day-to-day -day basis as individuals using our own personal devices. And the fact that we are all connected to each other and we're using a variety of devices, smartphones, tablets, and, and, and computers, traditional computers to connect and, and, and transact with each other, we expect that from business software as well. So a, a key enabler of that is the cloud. And so for us at TradeShift, we see the cloud as a fundamental enabler for how digital collaboration happens and how the processes between the companies and the people and the software within these companies, um, these processes that rely on the cloud and in some cases, frankly, also on the on-prem software. Um, and, and so what we see is that the cloud is really a, an enabler for uh, a glue, if you will, that allows for this digital collaboration to happen, um, which leverages our uh, baseline assumption about how we use uh, mobile and social uh, technologies. And at the same time, uh, we do that with a very uh, app-driven approach on top of a platform. And the cloud has, again, uh, cloud technologies have given us a, 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 a blueprint uh, that we can and are using on the B2B front to develop uh, platforms that will have scalability and reliability for applications to be uh, built and deployed on top of these platforms. Excellent. Thank you, Mir. Julian, what, what's, your, what's your point of view on, on this growth uh, on investment in the cloud? Yeah, and if we, if we look at the market caps that you showed previously, it's pretty interesting because you can see many companies uh, that have become very big, like uh, Google, search engine, Amazon, e-commerce at the beginning. And obviously, the Apple with uh, iPod first, uh, iPhone, and iPad changed the game. Uh, and now everybody expects on the on the smartphone to get to have access to information anytime, anywhere, uh, with any device. And I think that's when we we moved from just internet application into what we call the cloud today. Uh, pretty interesting story about um, a customer, which is Sony Music uh, Entertain Entertainment. So Sony Music uh, is a company that had to change completely. We call that the digital transformation. Uh, and what happened a few years ago is everybody was uh, buying CDs and they were producing and, uh, and selling CDs. And since the the iPod, I, I, iPhone, and so on started to to move on they had to deliver music a different way. So the business model completely changed. And what we have seen is this company had to move to the cloud. They had no choice. So they had, instead of producing CD, they had to first uh, sell uh, downloadable music and then to stream the music with Spotify, Deezer, now Amazon, Google, and these kind of things. So the, 
the, the change from a standard company into a cloud company was forced by the market and was forced by the, especially the mobile, the rise of the mobile on the, on the internet. Uh, what, what, when it comes pro to procurement, uh, this company had to change quickly, had to adapt the business model, obviously, and they had to be more efficient. So what they did is, for example, looking at the global financial system, being able to manage in real time their new business model. And the only way they could do that is to buy cloud solution to manage their business. So we close the loop. Uh, digital transformation based on mobile device. Uh, people used to have access to information in real time uh, to transact. We call it uberization, these kind of things. And now, I mean, the only way to address that is to move everything on the cloud on a collaborative way. And that's where we are. And it's a pretty interesting story. Excellent. Yeah, that is that is very interesting uh, from the perspective of, of a client and in, in dynamically how um, businesses are being completely transformed and changed from their original frameworks and now seeing that with, with the development of this. So, you know, a lot of this then, you know, as part of these stories are driven by a lot of the benefits that you're seeing from the cloud, right? And I think a lot of that is certainly things that we often take for granted from a consumer-driven perspective, but we could also look at this from the standpoint of the cloud benefits from, let's just say, as technologists, right? So if we take a look at this, this simple diagram, um, what, it dealt, what it tells us is as providers of application services, whether you're TradeShift or Determine or another provider, you can see here that cloud benefits to our clients really essentially show productivity anywhere. You can be anywhere, anytime. Even, even doing what we're doing today through GoToMeeting and GoToWebinar shows an example of this, right? And so productivity anywhere. The ability to have off-site data storage and not having to worry about a particular location being targeted or, and we're going to talk about security as part of this, but looking at that from the data storage. No IT maintenance cost. Um, you know, not having to invest in infrastructure. The disaster assistance. The idea of always being up and always being on, and then this whole notion of lower cost of ownership. So these are just some of the you know the benefits that I think we we have really started to see and in, in, in some ways have taken for granted, but are really see, starting to understand that. And um, understanding this from an analyst perspective, recently Gartner had just published a report that basically said, look, when we're looking at even technology, procurement, and in the cloud, and the deals that are being done. I'm going to take this for quote here. More than 90% of 2015 deals were for cloud delivered solutions and suite, the preferred delivery mode because of superior upgradability, better access to innovation, and easier support for supplier self service. So, again, some of the reasons why we're seeing this and why this is discussion has become so important and pertinent. In, in trans and translating or going from on-premise models to um, to understanding cloud models. So why don't we take a look then here at some of those um, some of these examples? So I'm, I want I want you here and Julian to to talk us through you know as technologists as part of the business framework where have we seen or where have you seen the biggest areas of benefit? Um, that the, the, your clients uh, and partners are truly experiencing as part of uh, understanding, you know, what what cloud is doing for them today. So, Julian, why don't I start with you? This because I did my hair first last time. So, Julian, why don't why don't you tell me what are your thoughts? Yeah, and what's what's interesting about that is the the complexity to be able to provide the services that users are expecting. The complexity is is coming up like hell, meaning that to be able to give access to the to the services anywhere, anytime, and to add more and more information services, real time information, predictive information, the complexity is, is really getting higher and higher. And at the same time the users, the company, they want to focus on their business, they want to be efficient, and the user wants very simple application, uh, users adoptions. So you have uh, on one side the complexity going up, on the other side uh, users looking for very simple to use application and having access to everything with one, with one device. And everything is short, 
I mean, the, the time, uh, the speed of uh, of business is getting uh, faster and faster. So the company they need solution, uh, they need update, they need new information, they need new version, they need new services all the time. So the only way to be able to achieve this equation is to have specialized provider. Like Amazon is very specialized on providing the, the cloud infrastructure, for example, and they are the only one to be able to do it at the, at the, at the speed they do it. And then you need to have specialized provider providing services in terms of uh, uh, SaaS application, for example. And then the users, the company can use these services. No worries about uh, having to to keep to keep the to maintain the, the solution, to manage software, and all the complexity that, that is not manageable anymore. So I think that this equation is, uh, I mean, the only solution is the cloud today. Yeah, if I can add a couple of things to what Julian said, I think the 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 notion of uh, specialization is important, uh, but it also uh, enables procurement organizations uh, to focus on uh, delivering value on their own, as opposed to areas that may uh, not be their core competence or they may be slowing things down. Uh, you know, we've had discussions with some of our customers where uh, you know having uh, or not having enough IT resources to uh, set up and build and post and and, and deploy on-prem co- uh, procurement solutions is is a is is is, a, is something that slows them down in terms of how they can provide value to the uh, organizations that they are part of. Um, and so, being part of the the cloud software allows them to focus on what they do best. Um, and that's one dimension, which is, is the value. The other dimension we hear from our customers is agility, and and that becomes uh, very clear in uh, again uh, today's scenarios where a lot of businesses are um, are under fundamental threats to their business model because of technology changing um, at the assumptions that they've had over the past 50 years. Um, and so agility becomes extremely important in that uh, in that area. And if you take an, uh, an example, we were talking to one of our customers where uh, you know they were able to move a warehouse from uh, the US to China within three months, but it took them almost 18 months to move their ERP uh, environment to go from the US to China. And that that should not be the case. Technology should be running faster than the physical transformation that's happening around us. And and again, uh, the cloud model, uh, procurement uh, in the cloud allows them and allows us to offer a much more rapid uh, innovation cycle for our customers. What would you say, uh, uh, Julian, or Ermir, or out of out of the, the list that that uh, that we have here, would you say is probably the the top three? I'm going to put you guys on the spot a little bit here. What would you say if you had to call the three out that are the most important? What would you think those would be? Gosh, um, I I think the um, of course I mean the, the economic uh, I mean the the business model again is very important because the 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 only way to be able to access uh, I mean the, the this level of services that people are expecting now the company expect a lot of services the only way to get it as at a decent price is to move to the cloud and again we can talk about SAP or whatever but. Uh, and uh, now we can provide a lot of services at, at a decent price. And I think the economic scale of, uh, of the cloud is, is huge. Uh, it's a huge benefit. Uh, of course, the accessibility in terms of uh, you, you have no firewall, meaning that uh, no firewall, I mean, the, between the company and the, and, and the application. So that means that wherever you are, uh, you can access to your information. You can access to the... Uh, you can communicate, you can collaborate, you can talk to your supplier, and so the the accessibility is uh, is a huge benefit again compared to uh, traditional hosted software or even, uh, of course, the on-premise software. Mm-hmm. Um, after the the. Um, the less personnel training, this kind of thing. It's all about having less people uh, managing the the infrastructure or whatever it's uh, to the training, the IT, or doing things which is not core uh, for the company, and being able to say, okay, I just need the service. It's right there, and I don't I don't have to manage to hire to try to find the the high 
high-value people being able to do it is, uh, is a huge advantage as well. What, what would you think, Mir? I mean, just kind of final thoughts on this slide before we move on to the next topic. The, 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 top, the top thing that you could you would think uh, that comes yeah. to mind. Yeah, I think uh, the uh, overall theme of uh, being able to deliver value very quickly um, has um, a few uh, dimensions listed here. And the three that I would call out are the ability to improve flexibility, and, and that's uh, something I talked about earlier. I think that's very key in terms of how quickly can you be flexible to adapt to the changing business processes around you. Uh, using uh, uh, less personnel time is also a, a dimension that allows people to very quickly um, onboard their employees and for them to find value in the procurement software that they'll be using. And it's very important for companies to find that value as more and more employees are easily able to uh, uh, buy from the procurement uh, software that may be around in their organizations. And of course, economy of scale is absolutely necessary in terms of how cloud-based procurement solutions can uh, scale up and down based on the traffic and the volumes that you may be expecting on a seasonal basis for any organization. So I, I would call these three um, as, as related to the overall theme of, uh, of, of reducing the time to value and being able to quickly adapt to the environment around you. Okay, great, great, that's excellent. So what we want to do then is now take a look at the, the question in the room here that, that often then comes up with cloud frameworks, right? We've introduced the fact that it's growing, that it's out there, that there's tons of benefits, but often, you know, time and time again, that as respective companies, we get an RFP, technologists, IT uh, people within organizations, global companies are saying, we need to understand security, we need to better understand data, we need to understand compliance. And so let's take a look then at some of the things that are coming up in the discussion around cloud as far as <coughs> the concerns. So one thing that came up recently, and this is an article I'd highly suggest people take a look at, is the Wall Street Journal around the idea of safe harbor. And so back in October, I believe 6th of 2015, the EU court ruled that there was some invali invalidity of the safe harbor agreement that had been around really quite frankly since 1995. And the, the basic stipulation here is that there's concern based on EU, EU law of European personal information on servers in the US. And based on the ruling, the idea was that um, the national regulators would be able to investigate data transfers to determine whether they can comply with EU law. So companies now must use different methods to validate the transfers of their data. And so this has become a big, you know, an intranational, international uh, concern in terms of then, do I have data centers in Europe only? Do I have data centers in, in, in the US? And what does that mean for personal data? So that's one, one aspect to the concern over security and just national regulation or international. Another is really kind of then looking at this from just say a US framework is understanding how Companies are trying to manage requirements um, with regard to SOC1 or ISO 2000, you know, 2701 um, and, and the requ requirements that are being stipulated by companies to say, you need to meet these requirements uh, because we have data that is, is important to be uh, managed uh, and as, as part of understanding outsourcing of information or dealing with maintaining and continuing the improvement of information security these are just two examples of what organizations have to um, have to abide by. And so that's one aspect. And then finally, these are just kind of just overall views of security threats that most people think, okay, if I'm going to go to the cloud, what do I need to worry about? Particularly, say, if, if we're in a framework of on-premise and say we have uh, contracts that are certainly right now behind the firewall and on-premise and we don't want those to be in the cloud and shared. Uh, or types of other information, like I mentioned earlier, personal information. So these are some of the common, most common threats. Data, uh, data breaches, uh, concern over data loss, uh, what happens if an account gets hijacked, um, insecure APIs between one system and the other, denial of service, malicious insiders on the inside coming in. Uh, you know, we're hearing about data breaches happening uh, all the time. Um, you know, for instance, with the situation that happened at Target a few years ago, uh, you know, these are things that are continually happening, cybersecurity, uh, abuse of cloud services, 
insufficient due diligence on what to do next if something happens, and then the fact that you know you're, you're sharing technology on infrastructures where you're dealing with multi-tenancy, and uh, you know so how do I make sure that I'm using the right uh, instance? Uh, maybe I do the pri a private cloud approach as opposed to a public cloud approach, or we talk about hybrid, and maybe that's something we could talk about as part of this discussion um, for this section. But again, these are some of the most common concerns that we hear. If you get an RFP, where where we're at being asked to make sure that our technology can meet the requirements. Um, just examples of encryption, dealing with audit logs, uh, having a backup center a certain distance away, uh, recovery time requirements, and even security over payments. So, with with this with these things in mind. Um, what do we do then to make sure that uh, people are, are feeling more secure of the fact that you know cloud might be even a more safe framework than it is on on-premise, and there's certain reasons for that. So um, let's talk about that. But before we do that, this goes straight to the point of what we're bringing up here. Um, this this particular graphic shows that security tops the list about the use of SaaS in application markets. So we clearly can see here from the Gartner uh, study that was done. It was the top concern for going to the cloud, followed by data and application uh, integration challenges, and then regulatory compliance challenges. Just some of the you know the things I just brought up in, in, the, in the slides previously. So with that in mind, what are what are your thoughts related to you know all this kind of uh, concern over the data, the security I'm in the cloud? I'm I'm losing a certain sense of control over my my information and technology because I no longer have that within the four walls of my organization. So what, what are your thoughts? So, you know, um, Mihir, what, how would you kind of address this from that perspective, uh, knowing that the cloud is, is, is kind of where this is gone? Yeah, I think the key thing is to make sure that um, as prospective buyers, you're asking uh, companies that are providing cloud-based solutions uh, of for information that is really detailed and um, and has answers around your uh, data protection needs. Um, and so specifically, uh, you know, the, the the questions around how do we secure the content. Um, uh, what sort of uh, servers in which regions are we using to secure the content? Um, but what type of uh, compliance uh, guarantees to, to be offered in terms of uh, certifications? Um, you know, what sort of uh, security policies for access to servers do you have in place? Um, systems monitoring uh, processes that we have in place, and so on and so forth. I think it's just asking all of these right questions and and uh, getting certifications for that. Is uh, something that we advise all of all of our uh, customers and prospects to, uh, you know, gladly ask us and other cloud providers for. Uh, and 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 most of the cases, um, we have uh, provided all of the the guarantees to uh, ensure the uh, data protection needs of our customers in the cloud. Julian, what are your thoughts? Well, I think we have two topics here. Uh, one is about the data, and especially about the, the EU and the US and NSA uh, and so on and so on. So uh, about this, um, I mean, everything is becoming more complex because of the because of the issue between the different countries. Uh, we can see Germany now trying to protect their own data as well, so per country or per EU or US as well. And what's happening is we're talking about a global world uh, and we're talking about global platform and to be able to manage the data safely in the uh, EU, in Germany, in uh, the US, in other places, to be able to address a relationship in China, for example, uh, you need to have a very solid platform, a, a global platform with data center in, in different regions. Uh, hopefully Amazon is helping us a lot on that. But then you you need to have a, first a global company, so that's why mainly you have a lot of consolidation on the market. Now the only company being able to address uh, all these regulation, whatever uh, we are doing commerce in uh, in different regions, are the global company. Global company having real local presence in different locations like EU and US, for example. 
and having designed the platform in such a way that they comply with the regulation. I fully agree with the certification. I mean, we need certification. We need to make sure that the process is secure. Uh, but again, if you do not have the right platform, the right organization uh, to handle safely the, the, the transactions between the, the different countries and the uh, it becomes difficult. So the complexity raised, at the same time, the company have been specialized doing that. So, for example, at the term, we, we started to work on two, in 2009 in a, in a global platform, uh, being able to address the regulation. We have to adapt as well. The regulation is changing pretty fast. Uh, and again, we, we can adapt because that's our uh, I mean, we have people looking at that and we can adapt the, the system. So the first thing is making sure that you address the, the need with a global company, being able to adapt to the local regulation, uh, which is not easy. Um, on, on the security itself, uh, again, it became a huge issue uh, recently and it's becoming higher and higher and uh, being able to make sure that no one has access to the, to the system, to the platform, is much easier when you have a system completely uh, secure in, in a cloud, meaning that you access the system only with a browser than having a system in the company with a lot of people being able to access it and not maybe the, the, the right skills and resources to manage the security. So I think based on the security going up and up and up, uh, it's, it's really the, the, the way we manage that and we make sure that the, the, the system has been designed from ground up to manage the security. And the other thing is the new platform, so the new technology that has been designed recently uh, include all the security logs, everything is at the core of the system to manage the security. If you use a technology which is 10 years old, uh, it's going to be difficult to find the, uh, the right security. So I would advise as well, on top of course of the, the process and the, and the certification, to make sure that the technology you use has been designed to be, you know, to be executed in the cloud and includes all the, all the tricks inside the technology itself to, to manage the security. And you have many, many ways to do that. Okay, thanks, Julian. I, I think, and, and Mahir, I, I would say, if we go back to this particular to this particular graphic, would you expect that um, that that the top three are going to go down? Would would you think that regulatory is going to always be there because of the changing environment? I, again, we often don't know what's going to happen with uh, requirements with regard to national or international boundaries. But would you say that security and data application integration uh, will kind of decrease in that uh, the regulatory compliance challenges were going to continue. What, what would you, how would you address this and say in the next couple of years based on, you know, this is 2015, right? This was November 2015. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, in general, uh, security and privacy as a topic is, uh, is an important element that will continue to, I mean, my anticipation is we are going to continue to hear that and I think we'll get uh, richer in our understanding of this topic over time. Um, so I think we're going to have a much more in-depth uh, conversation around this, but that does not uh, alleviate the need to have that conversation. So that's, I see that happening. Uh, I think as more and more companies uh, adopt uh, cloud solutions, uh, application integration and data integration is going to take on a different flavor in, in the sense that it's these uh, cloud uh, integrations that are going to have to talk to each other and much less about on-prem to cloud. And, and that's sort of the, the shift that I see happening over time. Uh, and I think compliance is going to be much more of a standard uh, topic. So as long as we've had, had the right standards and the certifications, you know, it, it should be less of a uh, of an issue as long as uh, companies uh, like TradeShift and Determine and others have done the right certifications to provide such guarantees. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so if, if there aren't any other thoughts on, on, on this topic, and again, we could probably have had a, a webinar on each one of these topics on their own, but again, for the, for the sake of time and for the sake of digesting the information and understanding this in its entirety, we kind of want to then now look at uh, the idea of, of growth in the future, right? So we can see that there's tremendous uh, potential 
um, with predictions about the future. And again, going to our friends at Gartner, you know, they're they're making some huge predictions here. Uh, quite frankly, here, 50 percent of applications running on public cloud environments will be considered mission critical. Uh, a no cloud policy will be rare in the next uh, four years. Uh, 30 percent of the largest vendors' new software investments will shift. We've already seen that again a little bit from what I shared earlier in terms of the types of companies and the growth of companies in the in the stock market. Um, 2020 more computing power will have been sold by IASS and, and PASS, so, so infrastructure and platform. And I want to I want to ask here specific your thoughts on that. And then again through 2020, 95 percent of cloud security failures. It's interesting that they call this out will be the customer's fault. So that. That, that's an interesting perspective, and I'd actually like to get your guys' thoughts on that as well. So with that, again, there's a euphoria here somewhat. As there's a mix of euphoria, but a mix of reality. And the question then becomes, you know, how do you predict this? Uh, what, what's what's going to happen um, in the next five to ten years? Um, do you guys think Gartner's on, on spot on? Is that a little aggressive? Um, and what's happening? And, and here is, is also a slide that we kind of call out some of the core things that, in, in terms of our discussions that we've had offline of, of some of the things that are happening. And I think, Julian, you hinted at the Uberization. We talked just briefly about interoperability. Um, and we could also talk about some of these other areas like big data and predictive as part of the future, uh, where we're at today and where we're at in the future. So, so Julian, what, where would you think, you know, just kind of taking a step back here, some of the predictions that Gartner has and then just some of the things that we call out here. Where where do you think things are going? Uh, maybe particularly from the procurement technology perspective, but then also uh, just overall from business applications in general. Yeah, what, what I'm seeing right now is first uh, we're talking about the maturity of the cloud. And when you look country per country, you have a big difference. Uh, for example, the U.S. is very advanced in terms of uh, use, you know usage of cloud. Uh, in Europe, uh, many countries are advanced, some less, and you have some many countries in the world not using the cloud at all. Uh, so, I, first, on the maturity, I will say that there is a huge potential of growth in the cloud, especially for many countries to get to the maturity level, uh, just being uh, users of the cloud and moving the, the, the company information system or whatever into the cloud, using SaaS application in the cloud, being able to communicate, collaborate online, and, and these kind of things. So there is one, one big growth in terms of maturity in many countries. And at the same time, uh, we are just at the very, very beginning of the cloud, meaning that we are now applications that are in, uh, available, like Trade Chief, Determine, and many, many others. And what we see is a huge potential in terms of what can be done. I would say for me the, the biggest the biggest one is about what we call the big data, meaning that since you're in the cloud, you have access to the, the I mean a big 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 in information. So that means that you can you can access to supplier information, to market information, to social media information. You have access to so much information that if you can process that and do predictive and analytics and bring that back to the to the to the company there is a huge saving potential in terms of uh, uh, gaining on the processes and being more efficient. So uh, I would say we are at the very beginning, even in, even in the US, a huge amount of new services will come, uh, collaboration, uh, big data, these kind of things. But at the same time, you'll have a lot of countries that have still to catch up and to move from standard application to cloud application. Okay, Mayor, what are your thoughts before we uh, we get to the to the next session? I, I I agree with Julian. I think we are seeing um, what I would characterize as the tip of the iceberg here in terms of procurement uh, capabilities in the cloud. Uh, in the sense, if you look forward, uh, some of the things that are listed here, and we see that happening on a regular basis, that that the, the these trends are part of how. Uh, the the what was called the fourth industrial revolution um, is is really at the at, at the core of what we're seeing. While in in the first, second, and third industrial revolutions with steam and electricity and electronics, it was fairly linear. The this this time around, 
with connectivity, with mobile devices, with unprecedented processing power and storage capacity, uh, the access to knowledge is growing on an exponential basis. And if you look at that, uh, what does it mean for procurement is suddenly we have uh, a lot of data, as Julian mentioned, coming in from variety of internet connected devices, uh, the internet of things that will help how people buy goods and services because they will be able to take advantage of all of these data points. And, and it all comes back to when I'm on my mobile device, I will be having to, and as I said, an unprecedented amount of data that helps me make better decisions. And, and for example, we talk about uh, predictive analytics in our procurement scenarios where as a CFO, you would be able to see your spend patterns within seconds and be able to make decisions around what's going on in your organization. Uh, and all of that is powered uh, by the technology that is, is really shooting on an exponential basis around us. Okay, excellent, excellent. So these are these are ongoing, um, you know, topics that we're not going to see, you know, the full answers to. But I think you know these are. I think we we tried to do is address just the, the tip of the iceberg. I think as one of you mentioned on on this topic. Um, what I'd like to do now is in the last I guess eight minutes or so is we have some several questions that have come to you guys as panelists that I want to try to take on. So there there's one of the questions here that was specific to the earlier part of the presentation and said, hi Mihir, would like to cover a bit more details on supplier risk, uh, understanding that. So, you know, as part of this cloud framework, can you talk just briefly about uh, what that is um, and understanding that from, the, from this perspective? Yeah, I think, uh, so very quickly, the notion of uh, doing business with very uh, with many other companies requires buyers to connect all their suppliers and their entire supply chain with them. Uh, inherently, when you attempt to connect your suppliers to you as a company, as a buying organization, uh, there there are two big challenges. One is you don't have the information, the master data about these suppliers in a clean way, and this other is even if you do, uh, you can't. Uh, really have a, uh, a pulse on the trust factor because there's a variety of, of, of uh, risk uh, uh, oriented factors that you want to be on top of. Uh, those may be related to regulatory risk or anti-bribery or anti-corruption risk or uh, making sure that you have the right bank account details, that it's going to the right supplier's bank account and so on and so forth. Uh, so what really is important is to make sure that while you're connecting your suppliers in order for you to do sourcing or procurement or any other transactions with them, you have to run the right processes that allows you to be compliant, uh, to be uh, secure, and to make sure that you have all of the uh, tax compliance and, and so on and so forth, all of those things that might be uh, uh, risks to your, to your connectivity with your suppliers, you want to manage that. Uh, and and cloud-based software solutions uh, really give you a, a distinct advantage of being able to do that very quickly, um, and and definitely the network helps as well. Okay, thank you, Mir. Um, another question that came up, and again, because we showed a lot of information, is this notion of uh, public versus private versus hybrid uh, cloud. And, and and the one question here was, is really, why would I use? You know, do I have a choice of when I would want to use one or the other? How we understand uh, the differences be between the between the two or the three, uh, the hybrid, the private, and and the um, and the public cloud. Maybe maybe Julian, you can give us a little bit of your thought there uh, and what that means and and what that means in terms of applications from the, from our from our standpoint here. Yeah, and so it's a very good question because the the answer is not easy. Um, First, I mean the, the the pure cloud is when we manage the application in the in the public cloud. So that means that we can use, for example, Amazon uh, infrastructure to host our applications and to provide that all over the world. Uh, when we talk about hybrid, so that means that we manage the same exactly the same system, meaning that we provide the same software, the same release. It's the same business model. You do not have to take care about. The, the, the system itself, and we manage the, everything, but we we can plug our cloud infrastructure into something which is uh, managed by the company itself. 
uh, it's an interesting stuff. It can be used for very specific uh, stuff. I'm, I'm not sure it's um, it's really uh, that interested, but it's it's a uh, it's an opportunity for company not willing to use the public cloud for some regulation, for example, to still use the what we call the cloud business model or the SaaS, uh, meaning that they don't they don't take care of uh, of the solution by itself. Uh, the private cloud means that, actually the private cloud means that they house the application themselves. Uh, and, I mean, on the procurement, you lose a lot of benefits of the, of, of the pure cloud itself. So, I would say that the three options exist still, but based on the chart we have seen and on the maturity of the cloud, I, I will think myself that, and I, I can see that with many customers, even we, when we talk about the different options, at the end, I mean, the benefits are so much better in the public cloud that everybody is moving to the public cloud now. Okay. Do you have any thoughts on that, Mir? I mean, again, uh, given the from a trade from a trade share perspective. No, I think uh, Julian really got it covered. I think the only one thing I will add is that when we talk, when we hear discussions about public or private or hybrid, there is also this question about integration with the rest of your IT landscape, and that needs to be factored in. If you have an IT landscape that has a non-prem ERP system, then you want to connect uh, your procurement uh, data, which may be in the cloud, with your backend ERP system. Or uh, In that case, there is this integration challenge that uh, could be referred to in the scheme of uh, you know hybrid, but it's, it's mostly about keeping information in sync across uh, uh, systems that may not all be in the public cloud. Okay, yeah, very good. I, I think that you know we, as we're reaching the top of the hour here, um, we've got a, we've got a several other more questions, but I think the one that I'd like to ask here was really again, um, you know, if you had to take one thing away with what you know of of, of what we've shared today in terms of the impact of of cloud on everyday procurement processes, what would you say that would be the the, the one biggest impact uh, that they would that would they would take away? Um, Julian, what do you think? <laughs> Is that a loaded uh, question? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think really it's all about the. Um I mean, everything is moving to the to the network. So that means that the, the, the big one, I guess, is getting. I mean, company used to have a business process to automate their business. So we are talking about efficiency. We are talking about getting a, a faster, a more efficient, these kind of things. And I, I will say, what's going on right now is the business process inside the company is going to move outside in the cloud because they are they are now full collaborative. So that means that we are seeing not like a supplier uh, and vendors like a purchaser managing suppliers. We are just seeing partners uh, collaborating together on the same platform and, uh, and the purchaser can become a vendor at the same time using almost the same platform. So I would say the biggest one is really the, the, the part of the, of the core of the company moving directly from the internal system to the internal process into a cloud solution. So that's what I would say. Here? Yeah, I think a lot has been said, but uh, I would say in summary, uh, cloud, the, the cloud gives us the ability to capture an unprecedented amount of data and provide analytics and visibility to make the supply chains of our customers more responsive, more efficient, and as, as the cost to process these transactions will drop, um, the intelligence and the insight that is necessary to uh, to add value to the extended enterprise, which is the ecosystem of suppliers, partners, customers, and distributors. You know those sort of things will define the metrics and the KPIs that executives uh, really care about as they bring agility to their business uh, in in order for them to uh, be much much more able to cope with the challenges of the 21st century. All right. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, uh, both of you for presenting. Thank you for everybody that joined us on the on this call globally. We've reached the top of the hour. I just wanted to quickly share um, uh, just some information that if you have some follow-up, again, we're going to be providing these slides for you. These will be This is recorded, so if you want to go back and, and look at the presentation, uh, you can do so. But this is just some information as a takeaway. And, and again, uh, we look forward to sharing more of these types of events in the future. 
and uh, thank you again for joining us and have a, a great rest of uh, rest of your week. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was a pleasure.